welcome to the nonprofit show. We are so glad that you're here. It's another day, another episode. And today we have Jess Campbell with us. Jess is the CEO at Out in the Boon. She's been with us before, but we are so glad you're back. And today she's here to talk to us about summertime and the email is fine, which is really hard for me not to sing that, you know, <laughs> back to the, to the sing song. So Really glad to have you, Jess, and looking forward to diving into this conversation with you. But before we do, we want to remind all of you, our viewers and listeners, who we are if we have not met yet. So Julia Patrick is here, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, and I'm Jarrett Ransom, nonprofit nerd, CEO of the Raven Group, and honored to serve alongside Julia day in and day out for these episodes. Jess asked us earlier in the green room, she's like, I'm so amazed you ladies do such a fantastic job, which thank you, Jess, that means a lot. And I looked up and today is episode 829. So episode 829. And hey, if you missed any of those previous 828 episodes, I have good news for you because our sponsors allow us the opportunity to archive these. And I'll tell you in just a bit where you can find them. But we do wanna extend our deepest gratitude to our amazing besties with our presenting sponsors. So thank you so very much to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, as well as Nonprofit Tech Talk. I like to say that their mission is your mission because truly they really are here to serve you and your mission and your community. So do them a favor, do yourself a favor and us a favor, check them out because they are fantastic companies with fantastic people that really do want to help you elevate your mission. And hey, I promised I would tell you where to find these episodes. So the latest and greatest, go ahead and pull out your smartphone. I know you're probably on it or it's right next to you. You can scan that QR code and download the app just a couple of hours after our conversation that we're having now with Jess, the episode will be loaded to the app and you'll get that notification. We're still on all the streaming broadcast platforms as well as the podcast. So wherever you choose to consume your entertainment, guarantee you can find the nonprofit show. <laughs> So thank you for that. And Jess, welcome back, my friend. So again, those watching and listening, today we have Jess Campbell, CEO at Out in the Boons. How are you? I'm well. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, we are thrilled to have you back. Um, and right before maybe you leave for vacation, we also kind of got that nugget of information. But would you please tell us a little bit about yourself, Jess, and a little bit about Out in the Boons? Because what I love this tagline here for your not so average fundraiser. Yes. So hi everyone. I'm Jess Campbell, the CEO of Out in the Boons. I am a former nonprofit fundraiser turned nonprofit consultant. And today I say that I help nonprofits discover donors in their email list. So I am a super fan of email marketing. I love that. Wonderful. I love that. And I think that that is, that's just magical because so often we think we've got to go out and find somebody new and yet we're not taking care of the people who at some point in time had an alignment to us or with us, I should say. And so um, this is going to be a great conversation. And I want to start off by asking you why summer is this key period to year end giving? Like, why should we look at it this way? Mm -hmm. Or is that even right? Yes. So tell me if you're a nonprofit or, you know, raise your hand in your car as you're listening to this or whatever. <laughs> if you are feeling that the donations in 2023 are rolling in a little slow, you are not alone. In fact, the giving report just released yeah. new information that giving is down across the United States, across all donors. And I have seen that with my clients as well. And I believe in my core that an engaged donor is an active donor and the nonprofits who take the time in summer to have multiple touch points with their donors and prospects are the ones that are going to fare well during end of year giving season. The ones who don't, the ones who just kind of skip yeah. over that part and go straight into asking are going to be sorely disappointed. And I just don't want anyone 
in that position, especially knowing that giving is down. So I think that if you're an organization and you can do one, two, three meaningful touch points over the next eight to 10 weeks, you are setting yourself up with the foundation to be super successful during the last quarter of the year. And if you don't, you're just going to have a really steep hill to climb in Q4. Interesting. I love this, Jess, because I feel mm-hmm. like, you know, um, and Julie, I think you said this in the green, green, green room chatter is we're all a little tired. We're all mm-hmm. ready to take a vacation. We're all ready to put her out of office on, you know, but what we do now is going to set the tone for the end of Q4. And as we're recording this, believe it or not, that's about six, you know, well, before it happens, you know, we're at the end of June, but also fiscal year is starting for many of our friends across the sector, right? Ending yep. this month, starting next month for a brand new fiscal. So I love that you said between eight and 10 weeks, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, engagement takes time. I also really want to emphasize that as a nonprofit, I want you to rest. I want you to take vacations, but there's a difference between taking inaction and taking thoughtful rest. And so what is it that you and your team have the capacity to do over the next eight to 10 months? What reinforcements do you need to bring in to make those donor calls, write those notes, get those emails out? Is it involving your board of directors? Is it rallying a group of volunteers? Is it bringing in, you know, some interns for a couple of weeks to do some donor engagement? There's a lot of ways to do it, but I think you have to decide that this is a priority. We all have very long and very busy to-do lists and there could never be enough time if you didn't make it. I just think that this is the key to success down the road. And can you spend your time cleaning off your desk or, you know, filling out that HR paperwork or doing all these other things that have different deadlines? Sure. But if your priority is meeting a certain financial goal by December 31st, my strong recommendation is to invest in some donor engagement this summer now. I love this. And I love that you use that critical word invest. Um, and as a touch point, I think that's just really brilliant. You know, you, you advise us uh, or remind us maybe is the better way to say of this old adage, you know, the early bird gets the worm. Mm -hmm. Don't wait. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about that because you're, you're not saying necessarily, um, hammering on, on asks, but this could be a period more of communication. Am I get? am I hearing you right on that? Yeah. My experience with nonprofits is that the timidness or the fear or the anxiety around the asking is really a result of a lack of donor engagement. It's a lack of a relationship. If the last time you reached out to someone was an ask and you haven't done the proper gratitude and stewardship in between, yeah, it's going to feel kind of yucky and it's going to feel kind of awkward. But if you've been checking in with someone about their kids graduating from school or their elderly parent or that, you know, Ironman race they ran, then it feels like a real relationship. And if you're also engaging them in the impact they've made. Hey, I just wanted to let you know that that $500 gift you made back in December, that actually covered the cost of the entire bus ride for all 50 students to go to camp. Thank you so much. Here's a picture of them all hanging out the window. (laughs) Then it feels good. Then you feel like you have legs to stand on. And if you don't, it's going to feel weird and awkward. So use the summer to do that work. Now, I also think that waiting to do specifically your major gift asks until October, November, yeah. you're too late. You are You are so busy in the last quarter of the year and so are your donors. So why not start seeding those conversations now? Hey, so-and-so donor, can we meet for coffee in August? Can we talk about your gift that you made at the end of last year? Would you consider a new gift this year? Like start those conversations and what use you have for those donations now so that you're not competing with the holiday parties and the Christmas pageants and Hanukkah and just all the other things that happen towards the end of the season. You've already locked it in. I love your examples, Jess, because 
you know, I, I, I also can't hammer that home enough. It's like, you really have to get to know your donors. They're not just a number, right? They're not just someone in your database. Like these are people that also have a life going on. And, and just the fact that you mentioned, you know, like ask how their kids are doing in camp or ask how that Ironman went that they might've just competed in. Like these are real tangible people with real tangible life events. And I Mm -hmm. do love like, and I think the sooner we connect to our, our donors at that human level, we will exponentially see that reciprocal investment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's the easiest thing to skip over as fundraisers because you've already received the donation, right? So one of the things that I'm doing for and advising all of my one-on-one clients is to simply pull a list of all of your 2022 end of year donors, pull the list, whether they gave $5 or $50,000. And what I want you to do is send what's called a loop back email. I want you to send this email through like Gmail or Outlook, not your email service provider. I want it to feel like it's coming from a real person, not an organization. And what I want you to say is a rough version of this, which is, you know, Thank you, Jarrett, for your X number of gift back in December 2022. Your generosity blew our minds and it's been able to achieve A, B, and C. You know, we're so grateful for champions like you who are in our corner supporting, you know, kids in our program, families who want to get fed, rescue dogs, whatever it is that you do. And, you know, thank you so much, sending so much like love and light your way, whatever that is, right? I want you to loop back to their gift and tell them what it did, whether it purchased copy paper, whether that hired a new team member, whether that means everyone now has health insurance, whether that means like you are now serving X percent more dogs, kids, parents, whatever it is that you do. You need to loop back. That's actually a really large complaint from donors is that they don't know where it is that you're spending money. And it creates this distrust um, and information gap. And if you can just fill that gap for people, it's like you're bringing them along for the ride. And then they're like, yeah, let's do it again, you know, versus like, wait, I don't even know what it did. Was it even helpful? I'm not doing that again. Right, right. And I think it's really important to bridge that gap with the donor that a lot of times donors will feel like, yeah, I just sent in $250. What can that do? Mm -hmm. You know, homelessness is such a huge problem. My, my money's not going to make a difference. Well, $250 can buy a pallet of water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just really an interesting thing that we, we can be looking at that we need to reconnect. And if we don't help, you know, illuminate what what occurred and use that word impact all the time but i I think it's really an important thing to kind of marshal um, donors that might feel like they're they're embarrassing themselves or they're not even you know helping totally or what do we do if it's like a five dollar donation because i'm a staunch advocate for treating your five dollar donor the way you treat your major gift donor Mm -hmm. everyone deserves the same sort of attention Mm -hmm. and you're right you know how do you recognize someone who's giving five dollars i think you can use language around like thank you for being a part of the team that's working to end the world water crisis or thank you for being you know the kind of dog rescue advocate that achieves a b and c i think you can use language like that Mm -hmm. that says like as a community or you're a part of the 349 donors who did blah 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 you know i think there's lots of ways that you can still make it work so there's no excuses (laughs) Yeah, there's no excuses. And I'm right there with you on that train, Jess, about like treat your $5 donors just as well as you would treat your $50,000 donors. Um, I was actually doing a development assessment with one of my clients and there was a donor that had given under $100, but their influential giving, like their peer-to-peer campaign was multi-figures. And so this one person, right, like might not have had the capacity to give at their own high level, but they were so influential into bringing other people into the organization. And that was a huge like light bulb that went off for this organization. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. There's, there's so many ways to make impact and 
you know, if you do any of these things that I've just mentioned, you will be setting yourself apart from like 95% of organizations. You will really, really, really stand out. So I just really implore everyone to try one, try two of these things because most organizations are not going to do it. Yeah. You know, just, you talk about the, the email aspect of this and you started off by saying, you know, look for who's in your email I want to say treasure chest and how do we navigate that especially now in the context of summer talk to us about why email is our new best friend mm. so people and nonprofits are really uninformed when it comes to email marketing email marketing has a 38 to 1 roi compared to social media it's also something you own it's also something you have control over i've been on linkedin recently and my reach is just at an all-time low and i'm not doing anything different i'm posting the same quality valuable content it's just the algorithm is is not my friend right now where my email marketing, I have control. I own that. I um, also have basically received an invitation to be in someone's inbox. I always think of social media as like a drive-by situation. You catch what you catch, but it's nothing intentional compared to email where it's like they have opted into your email. They want to be there. And so people take a different kind of action on email than they do on social. People also, um, I think it's 48%. I'm sure you all have had um, Neon One on your show at some point or another, but they released this amazing email report. And I think 48% of donors, it's the largest category, prefer receiving information and taking action in email, not social. So again, with all this information, I'm like, nonprofits, let's be emailing more. And hands down, 100% of the time when clients come to me, they are not sending enough email. I agree. And I'm a real advocate for storytelling and providing value in the emails. I'm not all about being a broadcast where you just have like a ton of graphics and click, yeah. click, 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 click. That doesn't actually convert. It's a little too much um, decision-making for a donor. So again, Email is a great place to nurture, to have touch points with your donors. And it's a little um, sneaky because people, you can see on the back end of your email who's opening and clicking. Oh, yeah. So you can basically see who is proverbially raising their hand and saying, I'm interested, I'm curious. And then that can essentially become your list of people to go deeper with. So if you open an email analytics and you're like, okay, there's these 53 people who clicked on this article, why don't you then take it a step further and then reach out to them personally? I saw you clicked on this link. I want to tell you about a story about so-and-so, you know, it's just like smart marketing that you cannot know via social media for sure. Um, or even I love direct mail as well, but again, that's a little bit of a one-way street and email. You have just this kind of ability to do a two-way conversation in a way that you can't on these other channels. Okay. I have two questions. One, and I yeah. hope I don't forget them, but one <laughs> What do you coach by way of segmentation? And let me say the other one next so I don't forget it. And the two of you can help me remember it, right? Um, often I sit at a board table and the board members will say to the organization, we send too much information. We're sending way too much emails. We're sending way too many communications. So those, those are my two questions. One, how do you talk about segmentation? And two, how do you also talk about too much when really we know we're not even touching it? Yeah. So I'll address the first que the first question, which is segmentation. And I love segmentation. I think that you want your comms to speak to the right person about the right thing at the right time. I'm a huge advocate from having a weekly kind of broadcast email. So this is like maybe a newsletter or like a story or something that has um, very text-based, maybe one call to action that really does go to everyone. It's keeping them informed, entertained, educated, all of that. 
But then I think the loopback email example I gave a few minutes back, that's a great email to send folks who specifically gave to end of year in 2022. You're not going to send that to someone who hasn't given yet. You're not going to send that to someone who's maybe lapsed as a donor. And so I think you need to get a little thoughtful about who it is you're trying to talk to about what. I think doing a maybe series of emails to folks who lapped over the summer is a great, great segment to focus on. I think people who have given in the past is a great segment to focus on. I think your monthly donor segment is a great segment to focus on. I know a lot of folks listening are small and mighty nonprofits with not a ton of resources. So what I do with a lot of my clients is I basically use the same copy but I just tweak it a little bit. These do not have to be four totally separate, totally different messages. It's just probably switching the call to action. You know, it's just saying like, we miss you versus like, thank you for being a donor in our, whatever your monthly giving program is called. Do you know what I mean? And so use the tools you have and work smarter, not harder. Your second question about frequency and volume. I see so many organizations sending drum roll please, one email a month. And it is just not enough. I mean, think about it. You are competing in an inbox with the targets, with the anthropologies, um, with the Bed Bath & Beyonds, rest in peace. Amazon. Every yeah. single day they are yeah. in your inbox every single day. And I try and think of email like a the, the fire on a stove. You always want to keep it simmering, right? So my recommendation is one email a week. If you can't do that, two emails a month, one email a month is frankly not enough. But if that's where you are, I would rather you be consistent than just like all over the place. Mm -hmm. But that gives you the flexibility so that when end of your giving season comes and now suddenly you're sending like four emails a month asking people for money, it doesn't feel like such a shock to the system. You know, if you're like, only send an email once in a while. And then suddenly you're buzzing in people's inboxes with ask, ask, ask. People are going to be like, who is this? Like, why haven't I heard from them? Like this feels yucky unsubscribe versus you're in their email regularly. So when they turn up the dial a little, it doesn't feel as, um, strong as it, it would, if it's such a sharp difference, if that makes sense. I love that you say weekly, Jess, because I cannot tell you how many times I've even heard people say monthly is too much. And I'm like, are are we on the same team here? Yeah. Yeah. And maybe the problem is, is the emails that they're sending once a month. If the complaint is like, we send too much information and they're only sending one a month. Maybe they're trying to put every single thing into one email. And actually it's better to just spread that out across four emails once a week with a little bit less information because people are not going to read like a 5,000 word email. No, No, I agree. I I think that's the problem is that these, uh, the email is, it's just too cumbersome. It's too cumbersome to produce. It's too cumbersome to send and then to engage with. And so pulling it out to a one point piece I think is a lot healthier for everyone. It's easier Mm -hmm. to achieve. It's easier to measure too. Mm -hmm. You know, you send something out and it'll be like, yeah, our, you know, our open rate for this specific email was really strong because it talked about X, Y, and Z, not Mm -hmm. all these other things that you can't Mm -hmm. really determine why people engaged with it. So I think, Mm -hmm. I think it's, um, you know, a kind of a concept of less is more, what's easy to, to digest. And I think the other piece of it is, it has to be digestible on your phone. Yes. And when we create these things, we're, you know, on a desktop looking at, you know, big monitors and it just seems like, why wouldn't somebody engage with it? But we've got mm-hmm. to be thinking about that other side of the desk and how, mm-hmm. it, how it looks uh, to mm-hmm. somebody. Well, I'll also, can I just say something about the open and click rates real quick? So, um, with the changes that Apple made to iOS um, last 
year, it really inflated open rates. Basically, if someone has an iPhone and they use that email open app, it counts as an open in your email, whether they opened it or not. So open rates are not accurate. So what I'm trying to teach my nonprofits is to focus on the click through rate. We want people to be opening and clicking our emails so that when we do have an ask, it's not the first time they've ever opened and clicked our email. Mm -hmm. And so where nonprofits average click through rate, I think is around 2.3. I'm trying to get my clients seven, eight, nine percent click rates, which means you have to have a really juicy curiosity spiking subject line, like no boring subject lines, no July newsletter subject lines. No one's opening that. Um, And then you need to have something that tells maybe a third of the piece, and then you point them away to a blog post, to an article, to something on your website. You don't give it all away in your email. And by doing this, by training everyone over the summer, come fall, they will be conditioned to open and click, open and click. That is the name of the game. Love it. I love that. I love that we're conditioning because I, I, you know, I think you probably subscribe to this too, Jess, is that um, we have trained, we fundraisers in general have trained our society that Q4 is the season of giving, right? And so we can also have the ability to condition and train in other ways. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Jared, I think I you're that. absolutely well, right. Well, Jess, this has been, right? I mean, that's, we always say like, Q4, that's when all the money starts rolling in, but we know we need it the other, you know, uh, months of the year. Absolutely. Jess, this is fantastic. It, it's uh, really refreshing to have you back on, to have you talk about, you know, summertime email. So thank you so very much for sharing so openly and just transparently, you know, what you're coaching because you work with some amazing leaders in our sector and, and offer some phenomenal services. So again, those of you watching and listening, uh, let's, let's say thanks to Jess, CEO. Uh Yeah. And she's here for you. If you are a not so average fund fundraiser. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Great to see you both. Oh my gosh. It's been great. I'm really, um, I love your, I love your thoughtful approach and it's very manageable. Mm. And I think that's the thing. So often we, we hear about things and it's like, yeah, well, if I had a team of 15, we could get that done, but I don't. And so thank you. Thank (laughs) you for bringing it back and, and, and helping us to understand why we need to be doing it again. I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American nonprofit Academy. You've been joined today by the nonprofit nerd herself. I like to call her my nonprofit nerd, but she could be yours as well. Jarrett Ransom, CEO of the Raven Group. Again, we are here because we have amazing sponsors, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Check these folks out because as Jarrett always reminds us, their mission is your mission and so it's a really exciting way for us to build our sector just you really have done some great things for me today i love your approach and um thank you so much as Jarrett said for sharing uh, your wisdom and your actionable items with us today my pleasure have a great one hey thank you, you everyone as we end every episode of the nonprofit show we want to remind everyone to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone. Thank you.